Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Tuesday, March 21st, 2023. I am delighted to be here with Professor Paul T. Asimo. Paul, thank you so much for having me in your office. You're welcome. To start, would you please tell me your title and affiliation here at Caltech? I am the Eleanor and John R. McMillan Professor of Geology and Geochemistry in the Division of Geological and Planetary Sciences at Caltech. Tell me about the McMillans. Who are or were they? I don't know very much about them. Uh, John R. McMillan, I believe, is an early alumnus of the Caltech Geology Program, who, um, like many of the early alumni of the Caltech Geology Program, made quite a bit of money in oil in Southern California. Uh -huh. And uh, he and his wife, Eleanor, gave some of it back to the Institute to endow a chair. Um, that's about what I know about the Macmillans. So now I carry the title, but I haven't dug deeply into their relationship or their history. The title Geology and Geochemistry, does that suggest some kind of dual appointment or does that just encompass your research areas? The Institute is organized into divisions and options. An option is a degree granting program within, typically within, but not necessarily restricted to a single division. The GPS division now has six options, geology, geochemistry, geophysics, geobiology, planetary science, and environmental science and engineering. And um, having two options in my appointment indicates that I am a full member of two of those options that I help to design the curriculum and administer the program in two options that I participate closely in graduate admissions in two options um, that it doesn't really make sense to try to pigeonhole me into one or the other because my research encompasses both and crosses the line. What does that mean for your graduate students? Are they divided among those options? And others, uh -huh. right? Within the GPS division, we, <coughs> we think of an option as defining your course requirements and to some extent, you know, which building you'll sit in and who your academic advisor will be, but you can do research with anybody in or beyond the division. And so most of my students are in the geology option or the geochemistry option, but I have been thesis advisor to geophysics students and planetary science students and material science students and chemistry students. That's a Caltech story, really. Yeah. All over the map. What about, Paul, the, the, the Lindhurst Laboratory? Are you still PI of that? I am. So the Lindhurst Laboratory was built by Professor Tom Ahrens, um, who came to the Seismo Lab in 1966 and built a, a simple shockwave lab at the the San Rafael facility where the Seismo Lab used to be. When South Mud was built in 1974, um, Caltech received a significant gift from the Lindhurst family to build Tom a bigger and better lab. And that was pretty much the end of our involvement with the Lindhursts. I don't have any continuing relationship with the family. There are a couple of um, souvenir hard hats in the lab with uh, that the Lindhursts wore at the groundbreaking in 1974. Um, but that's about it. So um, I was not involved with shockwave research when I was here as a graduate student, but once I was hired to come back and join the faculty, um, I got into various discussions with Tom Ahrens, who played a very long game seeing his retirement coming and not wanting his lab to disappear. He gradually drew me in to the science that they do in the shockwave lab initially as um, a co-investigator on a proposal while I was a postdoc and anticipating coming back, and then a co-principal investigator on the next round of proposals, <coughs> and then principal investigator on the next round of proposals, and by the time Tom retired in 2006, I was running the place. What aspects of the lab have you made your own, and what aspects are really a continuation of what Tom built? Um, most of the main physical infrastructure, the big guns that we use to generate high-pressure shock waves, are still essentially what Tom built. Um, I have had to replace the staff now. I've had a complete turnover. 
running a lab like that is absolutely dependent on long-term retention of dedicated and qualified and experienced technical staff. You just can't do it without staff that stay for a very long time because there's so much lore. There's no training program anywhere that teaches someone to, do, to be a technician for a lab like this. They have to learn it on the job. And so Tom benefited from having two staff members from the 1970s into the 2000 aughts. Um, and I have benefited from having um, a little bit of overlap between those technicians and the people that I hired and have been able to retain the people that I hired for 10, 15, 20 years. How much is the importance of stability in staffing about safety considerations, given what that lab does? It's both safety and productivity and quality of <coughs> the data. Right. Um, we, sort of academics, um, don't think of what we do as a job, and we internalize as a, a deep personal motivation that we want to do the best science we can do and that we don't want to generate bad data or publish bad data as a matter of personal reputation, but also um, it's kind of our purpose in life. It's very hard to find staff people who think of their work in that way rather than this is a job, I'm going to show up and do what is asked of me and then I'm going to go home. And so you need people who both value their own safety <laughs> and therefore the safety of those around them, but also participate to some extent in the mission and, and feel the excitement and understand you know, why they're being asked to do this exactly this way every time, not just so that it's being done safely, but so that the data are reliable and nothing gets broken and the lab can continue operating over the long term. So, um, yeah, when, when for work like that, when you're looking for staff, you're really looking for people who are going to make it their own and um, be a partner rather than just an employee. Given that the infrastructure of the lab is so similar to what Tom originally built, what are the open, ongoing questions that demand doing similar kinds of experiments all of these decades later? Right. So the you know the basic infrastructure accelerates projectiles to high speed. Uh, what you do when you stop them can evolve and be replaced and be upgraded. So we have improved our detectors. We have learned to build more complex targets. We have moved towards um, faster shots and higher pressures. And my interests in Tom's are not exactly the same. So Tom was a professor of geophysics and planetary science mm -hmm. and was a, a member of the kind of the Seismolab group. I'm professor of geology and geochemistry, not a member of the Seismolab is a little bit weird because my lab is in the sub-basement of South Mud and is the laboratory of experimental geophysics. But that's but your collaboration that's the nature like of with of Mike the Gernis, they do they do go they do have relevance yeah, sure. with Seismolab. Right. So I came in to the shockwave work as an igneous petrologist, as someone interested in the melting and crystallization of rocks and the evolution of planets by melting and migration of magma from one place to another. Tom came in from a physical perspective of ballistics and cratering and planetary surfaces. And so we use the same equipment, but we have different science questions in mind to some extent. Tom was also um, very broad in his interests and had a very successful collaboration with Ed Stolper that showed what could be done in igneous petrology in the understanding of the properties of magma at high pressure um, starting in the 1980s. And that's the main thread that I've picked up and extended and um, applied to higher pressures and what goes on in the Earth's lower mantle rather than just in the upper mantle. Um, the world of shockwave research has to a significant extent moved on beyond what can be done with guns. Um, most people in the field are now using 
high-powered lasers, national laboratory kind of platforms to generate much more intense shocks. Um, but they last for a much shorter time. The targets are much smaller. In my view, the quality of the shock wave that you can generate, although it's stronger, it is, is not, as, um, not as good, not as precise, not as uniform. And so I have been able to carve out for now the past 20 years or so a niche of these are the things for which the for which guns are still the right tool and this is work that still needs to be done even though much of the field has moved into different areas using much more expensive much more elaborate um, tools to generate much higher pressures there's still things guns do best at the, at the end of the day. That's my assertion, and <laughs> I have so far been able to convince funding agencies of that. <laughs> to go back to geology and geochemistry in your title, what is your home discipline or the umbrella discipline under which everything else falls? There's geology, there's earth science, there's petrology. By your education or by the recurring themes throughout your career, what would you consider the, the foundational discipline? Um, I'm going to say igne <coughs> igneous petrology, mm -hmm. um, which some people might perceive as a specialty niche within geology, but to me it's an umbrella that covers any way of thinking about melting and crystallization processes, which I assert are fundamental to the geological record, but also to the geochemical evolution of and the origin of planets and the geophysical dynamics of planets. Um, so it's a, it's a way in to a wide range of problems. And whether I'm doing shockwave experiments or static high pressure experiments or low pressure experiments or computational thermodynamics or first principles calculations or field work and analytical work on real rocks, all of those are basically aimed at this phenomenon of melting and when it happens and how it happens and why it happens and what happens as a result. In the way that Igneous modifies petrology, are there other blank petrologists? Of course. So petrology, a word that confuses a lot of people because the root petros we, uh, just means rock, we most often hear in the context of petroleum, which is oil, oleos, that comes from rocks. Petrology is just the study of rocks, which to many people sounds like geology, but geology is the study of the earth, which has many parts and many ways to approach it, even though much of it is made of rocks. So petrology is just that. It's look beyond, sort of above the level of minerals, which is what rocks are made of, and below the level of terrains, which are complexes of many kinds of rocks at the regional scale. We have the rocks themselves. Classically, we divide rocks into igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary, and so we can also divide petrologists into igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. So sedimentary petrologists are looking at how sediment, particles that have been eroded and transported and deposited somewhere, are converted into a rock and what you can learn from their size, distribution, their, dis their <coughs> combination of uh, minerals that you find in one place, how they are cemented together, um, how they were transformed from sediment into a rock, that's sedimentary petrology. Metamorphic petrology, you're basically trying to establish the pressure, temperature, time, history that a mass of rock passed through from its untransformed state to the final state in which you find it which tells you about how mountain belts are built and then eroded. It tells you about how close you were to hot sources like igneous intrusions. Um, it is based on the fact that if rocks don't get too hot, if they don't get so hot that they melt or that diffusion re-equilibrates them completely, then they have memory, at least some partial imperfect memory of earlier states they have passed through. So metamorphic petrology depends on the existence of disequilibrium, of reactions that did not go to completion, because if everything went to completion, every rock would just tell you about the state that it's in now. Igneous petrology, which is looking at rocks that were once 
at least partially molten. Um, equilibrium, and therefore th uh, thermodynamics, is a much more useful tool because once things start to melt, they do pretty much closely approach thermodynamic equilibrium and forget what came before to a, to a much more significant extent. And so in many of the things that I do, really the intellectual framework, the rigorous scientific principle that I am able to bring to my interpretations is classical thermodynamics and tools that were developed um, by the thermodynamicists of the 19th century. I try to bring it into the 20th and 21st century wherever I can, but a lot of this classical knowledge, um, you know, mostly that all sort of came together in the work of Josiah Willard Gibbs, is really at the root of my method of understanding what information I can get from a rock and what it can tell me. Paul, the idea that rocks have memory and can even forget, wh what aspects of that are anthropomorphizing for our own shorthand, and where do you literally mean that rocks have memory? I mean it perfectly literally, right? Thermodynamic equilibrium means everything has change that <coughs> wants to change, and you have reached a state that is entirely determined by the current conditions, and it has forgotten, literally forgotten, any previous conditions because thermodynamic equilibrium is path independent. If there's anything about the system that has persisted from previous conditions that were applied to it, that's memory. That is a record that allows us to, in principle, reconstruct the evolution of that system over time. Um, so, preservation of evidence of earlier conditions is what I mean by memory. And so, sure, it's not encoded in neural pathways the way that brains form memory, but I think it's a very plausible and not anthropomorphized analogy to say that there is preserved evidence in a rock, in its minerals, in its chemical composition, in its texture, um, in its isotope ratios of earlier states. And, you know, perhaps one of the more literal applications of this is um, geochronology, right? How do we tell time? How do I know how old a rock is? And what do I mean by how old is a rock, right? The rock is made of atoms. The hydrogen and helium are 13 and a half billion years old. They come from the Big Bang. The other elements were synthesized in pre-solar stars that underwent various supernovas and events that eject nuclear matter into space, so it was available co to collapse and form our solar system. Right. Um, but for igneous rocks, we usually mean when was the last time that it melted and crystallized. For sedimentary rocks, we mean when was it deposited. For metamorphic rocks, we generally mean when did it reach its peak, highest temperature and pressure. Um, and geochronology attempts to tell time on an absolute basis, number of years, not just this happened first and this happened later, using various kinds of clocks. And to be useful, a clock needs two things. It needs to run at a reliable rate, and someone has to have reset it at some fixed, well-defined time that you are then measuring from. Right? If I give you a stopwatch and it's running, what does it mean? Right? Well, when did somebody stop and reset the watch and start it? So igneous rocks are typically the ones that people date, that people measure the age of using radioactivity because an igneous event erases the memory of prior events and resets the stopwatch. It equalizes isotope ratios throughout the rock. It drives off all of the argon or all of the helium because they're gases and easily escape at high temperature. And then once you cool it, they start accumulating and you get something you can measure. Um, so, yeah, if your, you know, if your clock is remembering, even in a blurry way, times before time zero, 
it's very hard to measure when was time zero and what do I mean by time zero. Either directly or indirectly then, how has your research contributed to studies about the age of the Earth, geochronology? Hmm. Not, it's not my field directly. Um, I have been tangentially involved with um, Ken Farley's development of methodology for thermochronology, which is a field of geochronology that operates at fairly low temperature. Instead of trying to say, when did this rock melt? It asks, when was this rock buried deeply enough that it was above some critical temperature? And therefore, how quickly has erosion been unroofing it and bringing it to the surface? Ken's method depends on the retention and loss of helium, which is a alpha particles, so it's the decay product of uranium and thorium, originally in the mineral apatite, uh, which is a calcium phosphate that concentrates uranium. And in order to have a, a useful chronometer from the accumulation of helium, you have to know the details of how helium diffuses out of apatite, which requires controlled experiments at very precisely known temperature. Um, and one of the pieces of equipment that I inherited from my predecessors, in this case from Peter Wiley, is uh, a series of furnaces with pressure vessels um, where we can generate high pressure, um, in this case on the order of hundreds to thousands of bars, um, and have a thermocouple um, which measures temperature to the nearest degree or so close enough to the sample that we really know the temperature of the sample. And so um, the calibration of that method originally by uh, Richmond Wolf and Ken Farley was done in my lab. Likewise, um, not about the age of the earth, but um, my colleague John Eiler, who someday is going to win all the big prizes in geochemistry for his very bold development of clumped isotope geo geochemistry, which is looking not just at the total number of odd isotopes in a system, but how often they are together in the same <coughs> molecule or same molecular group. Um, that method also requires very well-known temperature controlled experiments, and that was also done in my lab. Um, I also worked a little bit, again, with Ken on a method to measure ages of rocks that could be flown to Mars and put on a rover and do geochronology, I'm not sure geochronology is exactly the right word, aerial chronology, um, in situ on Mars. That instrument did not end up being selected for the Mars 2020 rover, but um, it was an interesting development exercise. Bringing rocks to Mars? Actually, in a way, yes. Um, the method requires being able to pick up a rock on Mars and measure the amount of potassium in it and the amount of argon in it without weighing it and without actually measuring a potassium to argon ratio, which is hard to do accurately. And so it requires mixing the sample with a um, what we call a spike, uh, an artificial material that has exotic potassium and argon isotope ratios that we prepare and preload into the spacecraft and send to Mars. Yes. This so is all the way to how to keep things interesting before Mars sample return. Yes, exactly. Um, so <coughs> I've been in, sort of involved with various kinds of you know, helping out my geochemical colleagues who are working on developing new geochronometers. Um, I've also collaborated on dating a variety of rocks for a variety of reasons. But mostly my, um, my shockwave work because it's been aimed at understanding the properties of magma at very high pressures, where magma typically does not occur anymore because the earth is too cold, um, informs the way that people have thought about the very early evolution of the earth, and in particular, the evolution of what we call magma oceans. So a magma ocean, classically, is what happens during the period of heavy bombardment when there are constant impacts, large impacts that melt surface regions of a planet. If you keep up the impact flux enough, you keep remelting it before it freezes and you end up with a planet 
covered by a layer of some thickness of melt. Um, the largest impact that we think we know about is the one between the proto-Earth and a Mars-sized object that is likely to have created the Moon somewhere around 4.52 billion years ago, which in most models leaves the Earth in a completely molten state. Mantle molten all the way to the bottom. It's not then that state anymore, so you've got to freeze it, and that sets the initial conditions for everything that comes after. So understanding what a 3,000 kilometer thick layer of magma of average mantle composition would do and how it would freeze and what record there might be still readable on the Earth today of such an event. That's the grand challenge of why I've been going to all this effort to measure the density of magma at conditions where there isn't any magma anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's not directly related to measuring the age. We think we know the age of these events based on what we've been able to do principally with moon rocks, which are all very old and, and remember this era. Um, there's not very much rock, rock record on the Earth that dates back to this time, um, for obvious reasons. You melted everything. <laughs> As you've alluded, there's aspects of your research that are purely terrestrial and aspects that are focused on other planets or other celestial bodies. So what are the areas that you see as purely celestial, purely terrestrial, and perhaps most interestingly, where are the connecting points that enrich both aspects? Yeah. Um, I'm primarily interested in other planets, not from an exploration point of view, but from a comparative planetology point of view. Alternate scenarios, alternate experiments that went down a different pathway from the pathway the Earth went down, and why, and what are the branch points that make, say, Venus Venus-like and Earth Earth-like and Mars Mars-like. And so, um, you know, the, the fascinating details of the, the current state and the, and the history that we can read of the, of the environments on other planets, I'm always trying to get back to the root of it. Why did it get to be that way? Um, I'm also, unlike many people that study Mars, not especially motivated by trying to find evidence of life um, on Mars. I have always thought that NASA is making a mistake by focusing so much of the motivation for the Mars Research Program on the search for life, because if you never find it, what was the point? Then that's a very strong possibility. Mm -hmm. um, so over the arc of my career, um, I actually started out in planetary science as an undergraduate. I'm gonna pause. Sure. My phone has been ringing a lot. And we're back. We're back. Um, so my, um, we'll get uh, I suppose into I this in the next interview, but I discovered planetary science as an undergraduate at Harvard. Um, I wrote a senior thesis about impact processes on Venus. I was admitted to Caltech by the geochemistry and planetary science options because I said I was looking for a graduate school that did both earth science and planetary science in the same mm -hmm. department or division so that I didn't really have to commit to one or the other yet. Um, and then I had a really negative experience with mission bureaucracy and politics and whether I could keep working on Venus even after I graduated from Harvard and no longer was a student of a member of the Magellan science team. And I was offered a very interesting problem in essentially terrestrial um, petrology here, and so I said, I'm done with planetary science, I'm going to generate my own data in my own lab or in my own computer and not depend on um, missions. <coughs> I pretty much kept that up for about 20 years. Um, <laughs> but uh, there is so much interesting work to do, and you can learn so much for about the Earth and about terrestrial planets in general from working at more than one that 
I've allowed myself to be drawn into more planetary problems here and there. As you noted, I'm curious the extent to which JPL has been an asset for your research over the years, and if it has pulled you in to research projects that you weren't expecting. Yes. Um, not a, not a not a key asset for the most part. Um, I've only been distantly involved with um, with JPL and with missions. Um, I do have a stu PhD student right now who is working on perseverance data, um, but even so, it's not by any means the main area that I'm working in, and I don't have the time and the dedication to follow mission operations at the level of detail that the constant stream of, of data and decision making that actually in involves operating a mission requires. So, um, yes, I have had several collaborations with JPL, um, but I don't feel like they've really been central to my career at this point. Running laboratories, working as an experimentalist, do you serve as your own theorist? Are there theories that you rely on that provide an intellectual framework for what the data is telling you? Yes. I am by no means a pure experimentalist. Um, I like having in my own mind the ability to approach problems from multiple perspectives. And so um, when necessary, when I go beyond my own expertise, I will collaborate with theorists, but for the most part I am indeed my own theorist. What's an example of collaboration where you need expertise beyond your own? When I first realized that um, I needed to get beyond the classical thermodynamic level to the atomic level to understand what was going on in silicate liquids, I realized I was going to have to start doing ab initio simulations or empirical molecular dynamics simulations, and I wasn't going to learn that from scratch or be able to really train a graduate student without a co-advisor. And so I have um, worked closely with Bill Goddard from the chemistry division mm -hmm. over many years now on training my students to do and then gradually training myself to understand and use intelligently um, molecular simulation methods applied to natural materials, especially minerals and um, magmas. So. Yeah, Goddard has been my closest collaborator outside the GPS division for quite a few years now. The phrasing is interesting, beyond thermodynamics to the atomic level. Is that to say Newtonian physics doesn't have much to tell us about matter at the atomic scale? Molecular dynamics is a semi-classical approach, or sometimes an entirely classical approach. It basically says um, we can treat the electrons as quantum particles and the nuclei as classical particles. And that's the Born-Oppenheimer approximation of separating those two time scales and mass scales. Because if we know where all the nuclei are, they are basically point charges and they exert forces on each other, just regular electromagnetism. If we know where all the electrons are, in a probabilistic sense, if we know the wave function, then we know the forces between the electrons and the nuclei, and now we know all the forces on the nuclei, and now we can just apply Newtonian mechanics to say this is how the nuclei are accelerated by those forces. And we take a small time step, move the atoms, update their positions and velocities, and then say, okay, given 
if we were to stop for a moment and say, now the atoms are here, how does the electron distribution respond? Now we know all the forces. Now we can use Newtonian mechanics to accelerate the electrons, the, the nuclei again. So it's a semi-classical method in that the electrons are treated using density functional theory, which is an approximate implementation of quantum mechanics, the recasting of the Schrodinger equation. Mm -hmm. But the nuclei are just basically um, ballistic masses with charge obeying Newtonian mechanics according to the forces on them. That's molecular dynamics. It is computationally expensive to solve a many electron um, density functional theory problem every femtosecond for systems with many electrons. Expensive because that's a storage issue? Just it's a huge amount of data? No, it's computationally expensive. It, it's a lot of CPU time. Uh -huh. um, essentially because the basis functions that we use to decompose the wave function um, require many, many, many terms in the sums to approximate accurately enough um, what the electron density is so that we can then get accurate enough forces so we can move the atoms correctly. So, no, it's not primarily a storage problem. It's primarily just CPU time. It's very parallelizable. It works nicely on clusters. Um, this is to say parallel computing has been very important for you. Absolutely. Um, so, for problems that are too hard, for the state of the art in computing directly the first principles molecular dynamics, we turn to empirical molecular dynamics, meaning we make up some function that describes what the forces on the atoms are, and that function is very quick to evaluate, and so you, now you can run simulations of millions of atoms for long periods of time. By long, I mean milliseconds. <laughs> Instead of what the state of the art in ab initio molecular dynamics is hundreds of atoms for hundreds of picoseconds. Right? When you get to large scale problems that you cannot address with hundreds of atoms or that require long time scales that you cannot address with hundreds of picoseconds, you have to turn to empirical molecular dynamics, which is only as good as the force field. Right? So a lot of Bill Goddard's work has been developing better force fields to do better empirical molecular dynamics on fairly large-scale systems that you need to understand the kind of problems he's interested in in catalysis. Um, but a magma is a system that is hard to address with a few atoms on a short time scale because they're not periodic. In a solid, you can just solve the dynamics of one unit cell and now you understand the whole solid. Liquids don't have unit cells. We're often interested in complex compositions that have many atoms, and the effect of one, a small concentration of some element <coughs> may have an outsized influence. And if you don't have a lot of atoms, you can't have a small concentration mm -hmm. of one atom because you need a big denominator to get a small concentration. And liquids have long time scale behaviors, especially at low temperature. They have memory, if you will, in their configuration of the series of pressures, temperatures, volumes that they have passed through. And it takes, depending on the temperature, maybe a long time for them to evolve. The classical example of this is the glass transition, right? A glass is a super cool liquid whose time scales of memory are longer than the time scales over which you're changing their temperature. And so the classical glass transition is observed when the relaxation time gets to be larger than about a second. So we can heat things up and cool them down at, at Kelvin per second. And if it stops keeping up with changes in temperature, um, it's a glass. So if I want to be able to understand a glass, I have to be able to run a simulation for a order a second, and I can't do that ab initio. So um, the um, Classical ways of doing that involve using human judgment to 
decompose the forces among atoms into various terms and then attempt to find functions that parameterize those terms and then calibrate the coefficients of those functions. The new way to do it, the new way to, is like the new way to do many things, which is take away the human intelligence and use machine learning and just throw a vast amount of calibration data, either experimental data or ab initio calculations, into the input port of a neural network and let it decide what the function is that will then output the forces. Um, so there's a number of research groups that have been going in that direction. I'm thinking of going in that direction in the near future. Um, You've been convinced of the value of machine learning? No. You're willing to try, though? I'm willing to try. <laughs> yes, that's well put. Paul, question about fundamental research versus potential application. So obviously, almost everything that you do would be considered basic science, curiosity-driven. Are you ever motivated by particular applications, or have you seen your research become of interest in industrial settings? And have you gotten involved if it has? A little bit. So the apparatus that I have is dual use, right? You can s study natural materials. You can study synthetic materials. You can synthesize imitations of natural materials. You can synthesize new things. So um, I advised some years ago now a material science student um, who had a falling out with his advisor in material science but was already working in my lab because they needed high pressure. And so I was the advisor to a PhD thesis about thermoelectric materials. Thermoelectrics are materials that generate a voltage when subjected to a temperature gradient or conversely will transport heat when a, uh, an electrical potential gradient is applied to them. So you can use them as active cooling elements. That's the Peltier effect. You can also use them for power cogeneration. Any place you have waste heat, you may as well coat the boundary between the hot part and the cold part with thermoelectric materials and generate um, power. And of course, radioisotope thermoelectric generators, which power a spacecraft, are using thermoelectric materials to convert the heat from the plutonium into usable power. You want them to be um, good um, thermal insulators so that you don't just lose your heat by conduction. You want them to be um, good electrical conductors so that you don't waste all the voltage you generated just getting through the thermoelectric material itself. There are standards for what makes a good thermoelectric material, and um, so I got involved in synthesizing some interesting candidates that required high pressure to get into the stability field. Um, that ultimately did not lead to any any patents or any commercialization. Much later, maybe five, six years ago, I was approached by a group from USC that is interested in sodium ion batteries as a green alternative to lithium ion batteries. And they had a theory that um, synthesizing their anodes at high pressure would make them um, more stable and higher performance. So I said, cool, let's collaborate. We made some um, graphene phosphorus composites uh, at high pressure in my experimental apparatus that turned out to perform very well. And there is a patent on which I am a co-inventor for um, layered graphene high pressure phosphorus anodes for sodium ion batteries. Nobody's commercialized it yet, but it's out there. I have been involved for several years now in the story that may have come across your history desk at a few points, which is quasi-crystals. Yeah, sure. Um, so um, we've learned to make quasi-crystals by shock synthesis in my lab, originally to test whether the ones that are found in the Chaturka meteorite that Paul Steinhardt found yeah. um, are are they really natural and why are they there? And the answer to why they are there is you can easily make them, if you have the right starting materials, with shock waves. And now we've learned that not just the kinds of shock waves that result from asteroids running into each other, 
but also shock waves generated by nuclear explosions, shock waves generated in my laboratory, shock waves generated by lightning strikes or electrical discharges. All of these things will make quasicrystals. Um, in principle, quasicrystals may have uh, industrial applications because they have a range of exotic properties. They have not been extensively commercialized. The only um, application that's reached the market is uh, non-stick coatings for cookware that, um, as an alternative to ceramics and that performs to much higher temperature than Teflon. I do have a visitor um, who's here now who is interested in potential um, commercial applications of quasi-crystalline materials. He's interested in their magnetic properties and is making quasi-crystals with rare earth elements in them that could potentially be more powerful magnets than classical crystalline rare earth element magnets um, or that could exploit a number of um, quantum level effects to have very interesting electronic or magnetic properties. So we are actually collaborating with the Rosenbaum lab to um, study some of these quasi-crystals that we have synthesized by shock at cryogenic conditions to see if they are superconductors, if they are spin glasses, if they exhibit magneto resistance or magnetocaloric effects or a variety of complex and interesting um, physical properties of ordered and disordered magnetic spins that I don't actually understand in detail, but I'm willing to help on the experimental end and try to keep up with the theory. Paul, tell me about field work for you. What are the kinds of things that compel you to go out in the field? So I should acknowledge that the notion of field work, of being able to travel and spend time outdoors and be paid for it, as a, an inherent part of my work is what drew me, one of the things that drew me to earth science in the first place, right? And so the You love the outdoors in Absolutely, general. right. And, and, and we'll get into this, but this is, um, one of the beautiful things and one of the challenges about earth science and in particular about diversity in earth science is who has the opportunity to get an appreciation for the outdoors, to learn to love the outdoors, to learn to feel safe in the outdoors, and therefore understands this motivation to study the earth. Um, there are social and ethnic and racial and gender biases in the availability of that experience mm -hmm. to people, um, for sure one of the things that makes earth science lag behind other fields. Mm -hmm. But I absolutely <coughs> had a father who was interested in the outdoors and took us camping and gave us that appreciation. And uh, so I always had that. So field work is challenging and knowing when there are problems that can best be addressed by field work is challenging so that you're not just tramping over the same ground that has been tramped over before and it's not necessarily my greatest gift so i have not had that many opportunities to do field research but when such opportunities arise i take them and then i remember that this is why i got into this field in the first place yeah. <laughs> Um, so for them, so remembering back, I was admitted to graduate school here in geochemistry and planetary science, but my degree is in geology because the difference between being a geochemistry PhD student here and a geology PhD student is the geology students all have to take three quarters of advanced field work, and I wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'm going to be a geologist and do the field work training whatever my research ends up being, whether any of it is field-based or not, I want to have those skills. I want to get outdoors with these really great field instructors and learn how they look at the world. Um, and at some point, we'll get into the great field instructors that I had the opportunity sure. to work with. But after graduate school, 
and being trained in field work, um, there were long periods of time when I didn't get to the field much at all. So after I finished here, I did a postdoc at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, which is a kind of an oceanographic institution mm -hmm. and um, sends people to sea a lot. Didn't actually go to sea while I was a postdoc, but I learned to work with data from rocks collected from the seafloor. And so a few years later, my postdoc advisor, Charlie Langmuir, invited me on a research cruise. So I was able to spend 35 days at sea uh, in the South Pacific collecting rocks um, as back when I was an associate professor. And that was a very interesting experience. I haven't gone back, but I like doing it once. Um, and um, the last seven years or so, I've been much more involved in research on real rocks collected from the field, mostly by other people uh, in areas that I may not have gone to, but they come to me to collaborate because I have resources to analyze and interpret their rocks. But I was able to put together an expedition in 2018 to Baffin Island in Arctic Canada uh, to uh, collect samples and bring them back and interpret them. Um, this past summer, uh, I went to Cameroon in West Africa um, because we hired a postdoc that I had been working with in this mode of you do the field work there in Africa, send me the rocks, I will use all these expensive analytical machines that we have here to generate data and send it back to you. Um, but after he finished his PhD, we hired him as a postdoc here and his project involved field work there in Cameroon. So I said, I'm coming. <laughs> I want to see the field area. I want to get my boots dirty. Uh, and that was pretty exciting. Apart from those trips, research crews in um, near Tonga, the expedition to Baffin Island, the expedition to Cameroon, apart from that, my field work has been teaching. Mm -hmm. I run field trips for students, mostly for inspiration rather than for research. In other words, as part of being educated as geologist you really ought to get out and see the world and so I haven't taught any of the kind of specialty courses that involve really digging in to a particular field area and milking it for information I've taught the introductory level courses where the field work is more about getting out there getting back <laughs> uh, gaining an appreciation for how you look and see uh, what's in the field and um, getting the spark of excitement to want to go out there and do it again for longer and more detail. This is probably as much a philosophy as it is a science question. Back in the lab, when you do simulations, what is the utility of simulations in terms of the real world and where are its obvious endpoints? Where, where is the natural point at which you say it's not real life? We can only infer so much as a result of simulation. Um, the Earth is arbitrarily complicated. It has information and effects at all spatial and temporal scales and it we accept when we go to some region or when we look at a planet that we are not going to solve all problems completely and understand everything from the atomic to the planetary scale and from the femtosecond to the billion year time scale Nobody can do that. It's too much information. So everybody ignores some part of the problem and grapples with the part of the problem that they can wrap their heads around and make some progress on. So a simulation, even if it's a multi-scale simulation, addresses some part of this complex problem and hopefully gives you some insight into that aspect of the problem which allows you to 
could push up against the boundaries of if I have this very nice coherent theory that explains this one thing at this one scale about this system where do I lose resolution right when do I where do I get out of the um, domain that my simulation is applicable to those are hard questions and um, it's the reason that qualified, educated, intelligent, well-meaning people can sharply disagree <laughs> uh, for years on end about aspects of earth science um, because they're each coming at it from their own perspective and they're each right from their own perspective, but neither of them is completely right. Mm -hmm. um, so what I have found to be a really useful approach, and I learned this from Ed Stolper, is find the simplest model system that has the essential behaviors you are trying to describe in which you can understand the origin of those behaviors in complete detail. No simpler than that because then you don't get any insight and no more complex than that because you cannot build intuition if you can't test all of the characteristics of your model system. Describe and choose the aspects of that model system that you think can be extrapolated to more complex systems and work up from there to the level of complexity where you can no longer um, make progress. So the kind of work that I started doing in graduate school and that drew early attention to me and my work I have been a longtime user of a model for understanding igneous petrology using classical thermodynamics that is applicable to fairly complex systems with many chemical components, six, seven, eight, ten chemical components, meaning to represent them completely you have to be able to see in about twelve dimensions. 10 chemical dimensions plus pressure and temperature, something like that, and you can't do it, right? But this is the level of complexity that is present in real rocks because um, only a few very specially chosen rocks on the Earth are chemically pure enough to really be understood without involving many elements. So using that thermodynamic model, um, I discovered an unexpected behavior that was quite contrary to the accepted wisdom about how these kinds of rocks melt. And Ed's first response was, that's wrong, go do it again. <laughs> I did it again. I convinced myself that the model was right, but neither of us could fully understand why the model was doing that because the model was complicated. And so we simplified it. We found a model system that we could draw on a Starbucks napkin over there at Lake in California, um, and we worked that up into a complete description of a simple system where nobody could argue with our interpretation because it was complete and rigorous and robust and th there was no wiggle room in the one component system, chemically pure, just the only variables are pressure and temperature or entropy and pressure is actually the right way to look at it. And we found this behavior in the one component system and then we demonstrated it in the two component system and then we extrapolated back to the th complicated thermodynamic model system where we saw the behavior in the first place and convinced ourselves that it was right because it had the behavior we saw in the very simple system that we could understand fully and basically our argument was this is the right model system to work up to the complex system and that's still only a model Right, um, it's a model of a process that you cannot simulate experimentally and you cannot observe directly because it's happening slowly and at great depth in the earth but it gives us a framework for now interpreting 
what we find in natural rocks that actually erupt at the surface of the earth where we can pick them up and say how was this generated at what depth at what temperature by what process if you hadn't gone through that whole thermodynamic exercise you would allow a possibility a theory that is in fact rejected <laughs> it is excluded it is disproven uh, by the theory there's of course still a range of processes that have not been disproven that's how science works but um, the short answer I guess to your original question is models allow you to disprove things that are impossible and limit the imagination space of things that remain possible Paul some questions on technology so to stay on the simulation side what have been some of the computational advances that have really revolutionized your capacity at modeling? Hmm. Um, like anything else, the growth in the availability of um, storage and computational cycles. Uh, so when I started using this model, um, it had just been translated from Fortran to C and it took hours to compile on the workstations that were available in the mid-1990s. So any time I wanted to make any change to the code, I then had to twiddle my thumbs while it compiled <laughs> before I could run it. Uh -huh. And we could run calculations um, at a rate that t to do a, the, the model that I developed that kind of does a full description of what we think happens under a mid-ocean ridge took about um, 20 minutes to run. Um, now, due to having more memory in the computers, um, basically the compilation takes seconds and so it's much easier to update and improve and debug the code that's order, an order of magnitude or two more efficient. Um, and that model now runs in 20 seconds instead of 20 minutes. And so you can explore a much wider parameter space in a reasonable amount of time. So in terms of the classical thermodynamic modeling of magmatic systems, it's more efficient to write the, and improve the software and it's more efficient to run it it hasn't been so transformative that we could do things now that we really couldn't do then at that level. Um, the other thing you often want to do with these models is embed them within other models. So the model says, okay, if this is the chemical composition and the pressure and the temperature, what is the thermodynamic state? Which phases are present? Is it molten? If it's molten, how much melt is present and what's the composition of the liquid? If I know that, I know the density, I know the viscosity, if the liquid is going to separate, I know how fast it can move. It's all very useful information for embedding in a fluid dynamic model of how things move around at regional to global scale in the Earth. That's what geodynamicists do, that's what Mike Gurness does. Right? So Mike Gurness can tell me how the heat and the mass is moving around the system but if I can tell him as a result of that is it molten and what's the density and what's the viscosity then he can tell me much better what's going to happen at the next time step and which way things are going to move so it's a natural thing to do to take this thermodynamic model and embed it in a geodynamic model but then it has to be fast and it has to be absolutely reliable it must give an answer every time you ask it for one and the couple of times that we have really tried to do this, this is where we've run into trouble, is when you are running a model yourself, a few hundred or a few thousand calculations, if some of them fail, it's no big deal, you find a workaround, you restart it. If you want the computer to run millions of calculations, uh, that's not acceptable. So trying to make the model robust and come up with fallbacks and workarounds w is actually the most difficult part of that kind of um, application. So, um, parallel computing and originally the construction of the GPS uh, division parallel machine enabled us 
to handle problems of moderate scale and do those kinds of applications. It also allowed me to start doing um, ab initio calculations on um, tens or hundreds of atoms uh, and make that practical and affordable. And then with the migration of all of the campus high performance computing resources into the central campus HPC cluster, um, I've gotten kind of one step further away from the system operators and being able to go and grab them by the collar and shake them and get them to do what I want, which is the best way to get system operators to do what you need. Sending them emails is much less efficient. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, the efficiency of what resources you can run on a laptop that you can carry with you, that you can use for teaching and demonstrations even if you're not on the internet, that's been a significant development over the past 20 years and the high performance computing has been a significant development for sure for the code integration kind of methods as well as the ab initio stuff. We've talked about thermodynamics, we've talked about your work at the atomic scale. What about the quantum world? Your work in quantum modeling, what, is th what does that look like? Um, apart from this cryogenic stuff with the quasi-crystals now, um, where we're trying to get down to Kelvin and millikelvin temperatures to see um, whether there are exotic effects going on in those. Apart from that, the only level of contact I've had with quantum mechanics is via density functional theory, which kind of smooths over, paints over the quantum mechanics enough that you can actually practically solve the behavior of multi-electron systems. So it, it, I haven't had to deal with kind of the, you know, the true uh, spookiness, if you will, of um, the uncertainty principle and um, the, the challenging parts of quantum mechanics. Density functional theory is a way to make quantum mechanics practical and solve real chemical problems at scales larger than physicists typically want to deal with because you've lost already at that scale of hundreds of electrons. Um, you've already lost the real kind of quantum information science aspects of it. So my interests lie at larger scales, so I've only gone down as far in scale as I have to to be able to predict the behavior <laughs> that I'm going to see at the scale of a crystal or a parcel of magma. NMR spectroscopy is a very old technology. Has it improved? Have, have you used it at various iterations in your career? A little bit. Um, yeah, so um, it is one way to solve a couple of, of useful problems for me in earth science. One is quantification, absolute quantification of what is other what are otherwise relative techniques for measuring the concentrations of hydrogen in um, materials. So George Rossman um, has dedicated much of his career to trying to quantify how much hydrogen is present in various minerals. And proton NMR is one way to calibrate the otherwise relative techniques like ion secondary ion mass spectrometry or Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy or Raman spectroscopy that allow us to see um, hydrogen and allow us to measure differences in the amount of hydrogen between different materials, but there has to be some absolute calibration. So that gets back to NMR. And the other is this, the structure of liquids can be addressed to some extent through the structure of glass obtained by quenching that liquid. And glasses can be studied by NMR and many of the 
elements that we are interested in natural glasses have NMR active isotopes. So you can study what oxygen is doing using oxygen 17 and what aluminum is doing obviously with aluminum 27 and silicon with silicon 29 and sodium with sodium 23. Um, and I have collaborated on a few papers with people that do multi-nuclear um, NMR of glasses. So um, one of our alumni going way back, Jonathan Stebbins, who spent his career at Stanford, has really developed a lot of these techniques for using solid state NMR to understand glass structure. And his student, Song Gun Lee, who is a professor at um, Seoul National University, um, and I have collaborated on a few papers where we have synthesized glasses by quenching liquids at high pressure in order to try to lock in the structural characteristics of dense liquids at high pressure, but then recover them, get them out in the glass state where they have memory, and use NMR to interrogate their structures to see how it's different from glasses that you make at ambient pressure. And it's hard. I mean, you, have to, you have to quench them really fast, or they revert to a significant extent to their original structures. So we can do that with static high pressure as long as we can cool it fast enough. And we've tried doing it with dynamic high pressure, that is to say with shocks, where it seems like it should work better. But you can lower, you can raise and lower the pressure really quickly with shockwave experiments. That's what they do. The challenge is lowering the temperature quickly enough to avoid back transformation, and that's very hard. So we have met with limited success in um, using shock experiments to recover glasses that have any useful information that you can get at them by get out by NMR. That's more been a um, an application of our, of our static high pressure apparatus, where we can um, counterintuitively, I would say, achieve sufficiently fast cooling rates to lock in high pressure information. Tell me about the development of AlphaMelt software, what that's enabled you to do. Hmm. Okay, so there's a long parentage there. Um, the <laughs> the intellectual framework goes back to the vision of a professor at Berkeley named Ian Carmichael, who decided in the early 1980s that, um, or late 1970s, to try to make it practical to apply classical thermodynamics to predicting how igneous systems are going to behave. And he realized that to do this, you would need several kinds of data. You would need data on heat capacity of the components of silicate liquids. You would need data on the densities of various components of silicate liquids. You would need density uh, data on the compressibility, which you can get at through sound speed. And you would need a model to take all this data and integrate it into a scheme where you could make predictions of the thermodynamic properties. And Ian had a run of amazing graduate students who took on each of these jobs and within a couple of years were doing them better than anybody else in the world. Um, and the one that took on the theory problem of how do you formulate a model that is simple enough to calibrate in a meaningful way given the internal consistency and the quantity and the precision of available data, but is complex enough to represent the real behaviors. The student that took that on is named Mark Giorso, um, and he developed through several generations working with a mineralogist named Richard Sack to help him understand the solids because he was bringing in really new insight about the liquid and you were looking at melting, so we need to understand liquids and solids. Um, Giorso and Sack eventually put together the model that Sack and that Giorso and Carmichael developed into a model called MELTS, which was published in 1995. Um, and here in about 1995, we were doing a reading seminar 
in um, igneous petrology, led by Ed Stolper, a number of students and postdocs. And we looked at a generation of papers that came out in the late 80s and early 90s that tried to deal with the fact that natural basaltic lavas that erupt at the surface are not actually created by melting at a single point, at a single pressure, at a single temperature in the interior of the Earth. They are mixtures, we were re then realizing, of melts that were generated over a range of pressures, over a range of temperatures, separated from their solid residues and then mixed. And that process cannot be um, completely addressed with experiments. One experiment would never, in this framework, correctly predict the composition of an erupted rock because it's just one of the events that goes into the final product. So if you're going to understand that, you're going to need some extended model that takes the results of various experiments and allows you to assemble them into a sequence that could, in principle, generate a realistic volcanic rock. And most of the papers that were doing this were taking a purely empirical approach. They were parameterizing data sets from experiments to get functions that could then be used to predict um, natural volcanic rocks. And Ed Stolper, in his wisdom, said, these are all junk. This is a thermodynamic problem. This is a problem that we can address using the principles of thermodynamic equilibrium to govern the functional forms and try to take out the aspect of arbitrary judgment that goes into anybody who says, I'm going to fit these experiments to this particular functional form that has no real physics to it. So we said, who's got a thermodynamic model that can potentially address this problem? The only one out there was uh, Mark Yorso. So we said, let's hire one of Yorso's students as a postdoc to come to Caltech and do this problem and spend a couple of years and write the paper that says, what can you learn about basaltic volcanism and mid-ocean ridges using the MELTS software? Uh, so that was Mark Hirschman, who was a student of Giorso and came here as a postdoc while I was a grad student, and brought the code with him, which was not open source code, mm -hmm. but I got a hold of it and started learning it and started fixing it and finding bugs and started modifying it to do the things that I wanted to do. And by the time we got permission from Giorso, I had already found enough bugs that I had demonstrated my usefulness. <laughs> and so he accepted, you know, this this transfer of intellectual property, if you will, through his student Mark Hirschman to Caltech because um, we were contributing to the enterprise. And Mark had a number of remarkable visions, including that if you wanted people to use your model, you had to make it user-friendly enough that they could do it, even if they weren't programmers, because igneous petrologists are very rarely programmers, right? So he wrote a graphical user interface so that people could run his model. But the graphical user interface was somewhat inflexible. It could only do the things that Mark anticipated that you might want to do. And I wanted to do other things and I had the code. So I wrote a very dumb, I don't like graphical user interfaces and I don't feel the need to spend the time to develop them. I just wrote a very dumb terminal text-based menu for interacting with the code that I could quickly adapt to make it do the mid-ocean ridge problem the way I thought it should be done. And in particular, what eventually um, led to this discovery of this curious um, anomaly where it was freezing when everybody else said it should be melting that I talked about earlier with then reducing that to the behavior in the, in the chemically pure system. Um, so I had then had my own version of the software that had no pretty user interface. The code was a complete mess because I was just writing it for my own use, but it had all of these functions that I was publishing results from and like Mark, 
I understood that if I wanted people to not just read my papers, but take these methods and apply them to their own problems, I would have to release this software and develop it to the point where other people could use it. And so AlphaMelts is the current name for what grew out of these codes that I wrote for my own use back in graduate school and started trying to release to the world in more or less user-friendly form in the early 2000s, about when I came back here as a professor. And for much of that time, um, Paula Antoshechkina, who um, came as a postdoc, <coughs> proved her value, and I never let her leave, is now a um, member of the professional staff, which is sort of the highest level of research staff scientist that you can achieve, <coughs> is a much better programmer than I am, and is dedicated to user support and code maintenance, <coughs> and has made, um, has built a large user base of people that understand why they would want to use melts, why they would want to get at melts through alpha melts, and why if they think of something that they want to do with it, that you cannot easily do with any of Mark's tools, if they ask us, we'll make it happen. Um, so that's pretty much the story of Alpha Mouse. It started out. That's I got a the, saga. That's not I a got, story. <laughs> yeah, I got this back door to the code. Yeah. I made it do things that you couldn't do with the public version. And then I tried to make uh -huh. those versions public. And um, again, having been able to hire and obtain long term funding through NSF to keep Paula here and keep her working on this project has allowed the project to grow and acquire a user base and for us to run workshops to train people in how to use it. And this is the way to get why, this is the easy way to get hi highly cited papers, right, is publish tools that people can use to solve their problems, make them accessible, support them, and the citations come rolling in. I should say that when you ask Mark Hirschman, did he succeed in the task that he was assigned as a postdoc, which was, here's two years, write a paper that says everything there is to say about this problem. He says, I failed, because it required a dozen papers over 10 or 15 years to really s finish that exercise. A successful <laughs> career, though. Yeah. Paul, the duality uh, in your laboratory work, shockwave techniques and static techniques, is this two different methods that are getting at the same questions, or are these really separate fields of research? Um, both. There are some aspects of shockwave research that are particular to shockwaves. There are others that are a way to get material to high pressure and measure its properties that is complementary to what we do with static high pressure. I guess the simplest way to put it is when we do static high pressure, <coughs> the variables that we can control are pressure and temperature. We cannot measure entropy. We cannot measure energy. If we want to measure density at high pressure by static methods, we either need a large enough system to get physical separation in a gravity field, or we need to do diffraction, which measures spaces between atoms and therefore can be converted to density. If we need to know the pressure, in the range where we have gas pressure as our working medium, that can be measured absolutely using things that are directly traceable to force per unit area. But beyond the range where you can safely contain gases, you have to calibrate your pressure. You have to have some way to, to know what the pressure is. On the dynamic side, we understand shock waves and 
there, the way that as they travel, they conserve mass momentum and energy well enough that we can measure pressure as an absolute number from conservation of momentum without calibration up to very high pressure. We can measure density of a shock material from conservation of mass, uh, even if it's amorphous, even if it's a liquid or a glass and doesn't diffract x-rays and doesn't need time to physically separate in a gravity field. We can measure energy because the shock wave is an adiabatic change of state that does work and imparts kinetic energy, but there's no heat flow, and that gives us enough constraints to understand energy. We cannot control the temperature, but we can measure the temperature. Hmm. Um, and so we can get at these absolute physical variables that we care about in materials, pressure, density, temperature, energy, um, and reach more extreme conditions without recourse to calibration than we can do in static high pressure science. But we only get a microsecond or so at high pressure. For laser shocks, you only get a few nanoseconds at high pressure. And so only some processes will keep up with the change of state we are trying to impose and yield information that informs us about the long term, information that is equilibrated and is not kinetic. So the problem, for example, of melting a mantle rock, which has four minerals in it, usually, and once you add liquid, you're looking at a fifth phase, and you want all of the components to equilibrate amongst all of those materials. That's a static high pressure problem. There isn't time in the shockwave experiment for all those materials to communicate with each other and reach equilibrium. So I can get at the physical properties of each of those minerals separately, which might be very useful for then saying, okay, if I do the static experiment and I melt this rock and I know that it's 20% molten at this pressure and temperature, if the shockwave experiments have told me the densities of those phases, now I can say physically what's going to happen. The melt is going to go up or the melt is going to go down. I can't solve either of, I can't solve that problem completely from either approach. I can't get the physical properties of the phases necessarily from the static high pressure and I can't get the complicated multi-phase, multi-component interactions from the shockwave experiments. So this is the way in which they're complementary, right? Then there are things like, you know, cratering. I want to know, here's a hole in the ground, how big a projectile made it and how fast was it moving. Static high pressure science is not terribly useful for that mm -hmm. problem. That's, <laughs> that's a shock problem. <laughs> Paul, last question for today. I'll make it a fun one. You're a dedicated and accomplished musician. I'm curious if you see music as a refuge from your professional life. You want to keep those worlds separate, or are there connecting points that make both more enriching and fun for you? Um, refuge. I'm sure there are connection points, but I don't spend time dwelling on them. Um, no, it's just, it's another thing I do. It's another side of my character. It's another um, skill that I have developed over time and uh, try to nurture and improve on. Um, but I've not encountered too many situations where my knowledge of music has informed the science that I do or the other way around. Um, so I, I'm going I'm to vote refuge on that. Okay. <laughs> well, this has been a terrific initial conversation. Next time we'll go back family roots, Southern California, and even before that we'll go from there. Okay. <laughs>